Phoenix process is fundamentally about self-discovery, the discovery of our true will, but also about gaining access to previously dormant capacities of mind like telepathy and remote viewing and even access to the Akashic Record so that we're better equipped to fulfill our destinies. Hey guys, it's Illuminostic in uh, the jungle near Ayampe, Ecuador, where we have been stranded <laughs> for a while because of the protests that were uh, successful and I'm glad to hear about that. I think uh, our neighbors to the north could follow suit and cause a little bit of chaos and maybe get something done instead of relying on a totally corrupt voting system. Hey, so we're back in uh, Vilcabamba. You can tell I'm no longer in the jungle. Um, I wanted to use that short introductory segment just to show you guys the jungle in Ayampe there because our uh, Phoenix Flames company is going to be doing some plant medicine ceremonies. Um, there are going to be pa packages that are available to our patrons. Uh, it is going to be a high ticket item. Uh, but it's going to include surfing lessons, a couple days camping in the jungle, uh, probably with uh, San Pedro, a couple days of ayahuasca, uh, plant-based foods. It's a very beautiful facility. They host facilitators, so I'd probably be working with a couple of other people. We're probably looking at some time in February to get these things going. And for every three packages that we sell, we're going to donate one to a um, impoverished person here in Ecuador that can't normally afford all of these things. So. Very beautiful place and a, and a great opportunity to give back a little bit. Uh, speaking of patrons, uh, we're going to start doing two patron-only videos a month, um, committing to this starting next month. So please do hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon. And all these people that have sent me messages recently expressing that I have, you know, you found some value in my work and that it's impacted your life in a positive way. I really do appreciate that. So um, please, you know, keep it going in the comments. Okay, so the Phoenix process. This has been a very difficult subject for me to broach, I think, because um, it was a very intense uh, time in my life. The process, as the name implies, is fundamentally a breaking down and restructuring of your psyche, your spiritual being, the lines that you have drawn that are basically the parameters of what you're willing to consider possible. Um, and I've noticed lately a lot of people are going through this process. People send me messages all the time, um, I get comments that I notice. Uh, I know people personally that are experiencing this. So what I'm hoping is that in offering my experiences, I, maybe I can save you some of the trouble that I went through because uh, I really didn't have anyone guiding me. It was just a matter of figuring it out as I went along. And you know, some things didn't go very well and were actually pretty disastrous. And some also some extraordinary things happened when I was able to maintain my balance and you know understand the difference between intuition and wish demons, for example. So, okay, this time around, we're just gonna kind of get into uh, how you know that this process is starting and kind of what to expect. But first, I wanna tell the story of how I came to call it the Phoenix Process, which is interesting. Um, I've noticed that a lot of people tend to use these terms without ever having any interaction. It's like you just spontaneously come up with the name, the Phoenix Process. And also, a lot of people tend to just call it the process, I noticed. Um, but when, you know, they're speaking about this, we definitely know as soon as someone says the process, what exactly they're talking about. How I came to refer to this process as the Phoenix process is a story that serves to illustrate how the thing kind of works. I've referred to this period in my life that was kind of like the peak of synchronicities and um, the meetings with the Native Americans that were informing us that, you know, the star tribes had always been present and that the certain tribes or many of the tribes around the world had always been in communication with them telepathically and all this crazy strange stuff is going on. About a year after the peak of this, someone who was there with me for a lot of it sent me a letter that said what happened to you is called the Phoenix Process and a lot of people have gone through it. I'm not really sure where she got that name, it was probably an author, or, um, I'm not really sure. But uh, about a week after I got this letter from her, I happened to be... Um, I guess, you know, surfing the internet, and um, I was a huge deadhead for decades. I mean, I still am, but even at that time, you know, I was probably listening to hundreds of hours of Grateful Dead a week, you know, I mean, a lot, a lot, not really hundreds a week, but you know, a lot. And I had read every book, every interview. I thought that I knew every word that Jerry Garcia had ever spoken, who was the lead guitarist of the Grateful Dead, for those of you that don't know. Um, and then one day I find a, an interview with him that I've never seen before in a magazine called Magical Blend spelled with a K, which was also extremely significant because this idea of magic, as Aleister Crowley defined it, the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will had become like a central focus in my life. And to see this interview 
uh, with Garcia, you know, the only one that I had somehow missed uh, in this magazine with that title was Strange Enough. But then I read the magazine, and he says that there was a period in his life where all of this really strange stuff was happening, and this voice um, started to guide him. And that's the voice that I was talking about before. In my case, there were actually several of them that seemed to kind of deal with different aspects of cognition. Um, but there was one in particular that was like a Dutch uncle. He was just mean, kind of, I mean, not like cruel, but definitely harsh and kind of dark. And I described its laughter uh, as this awful, mocking laughter. And so I'm reading this interview with Garcia, and he, you know, he says there's this period in my life where all of this strange stuff is happening, and um, something was teaching me all of this stuff really, really rapidly. And it had this hollow, mocking laughter. And uh, I came to call this period in my life the Phoenix Process. And my eyes almost fell out of my head. You know, he had just described the laughter of this voice with almost the same two descriptives that I had used when I was speaking about it to my friends. And here's my hero talking about having the exact same experience that I did and referring to it as the Phoenix Process. So a week or so after that, I go to um, see the surviving members of the Grateful Dead in their new band in San Francisco. And uh, at one point I was outside, they were having a set break, and every New Year's, it was New Year's, Every New Year's, the Grateful Dead would uh, have some big paper mache thing. It might be like a dragon one year, and one year it was a joint with a beautiful girl throwing roses. And they do this at the countdown to midnight, um, which happens at the beginning of the second set. So it's set break, everyone's outside, you know, smoking cigarettes or marijuana or whatever. And uh, for some reason, I'd gotten into this conversation with these people about how, you know, I thought the universe was basically um, like a phoenix. It generates all of the possibilities that can happen without violating any of the parameters of natural law and once that happens the energy or the light starts to consume itself it all collapses back in on itself and this causes another big bang and the whole story starts over but with some variation and that's kind of a oversimplification but I was explaining this to these people and I turn around and there's these two younger guys standing up against the wall and they said hey man could you tell us whatever you we just we couldn't hear everything what were you saying to them it sounded cool you know so I explained it all to them, and when I was done, I, I, as an afterthought, I turned to them and I said, it's all about the phoenix. You know, this is the, this is the primary symbol of importance to meditate on, to understand, you know, the one thing doing one thing, and the reflection of the, of the macrocosm and the microcosm, and, um, you know, the phoenix. It's all about the phoenix. So we go in, and the countdown to midnight happens, and a phoenix this year is what flies down from the ceiling. It's got lightning bolts in its hand and it lands on the stage. Man, that was a doozy, you know? And then the next day, these two kids are, you know, San Francisco's a huge city, walking around and they come up to me and they say, hey, we've been looking for you all morning. And I'm like, in, in, in a city this big and here we are, I mean, it's only 9.30, like how long have you been looking for me, you know? So point being here that this is kind of how this stuff will happen. And it can be so intense and so dramatic when it really wants your attention that, you know, you're going to know. You're going to know. And basically what it was communicating to me there is that I needed to spend some time meditating on this phoenix process and really thinking about the symbolism of the phoenix, which ultimately yielded, I mean, my child, you know, Nagual Phoenix, my last dog was named Phoenix, our company is Phoenix Flames. Obviously this became a central symbol to me and probably, you know, one of the, the three or four most important uh, allegories or um, you know stories that I feel like encapsulate the, uh, the the most powerful metaphysical understandings of the universe that we're capable of receiving as human beings. The process is basically initiated uh, when you start to decalcify or squeegee your third eye and piercing the veil is another term that's been used. There are definitely um, stages uh, that every single person goes through. It's like an archetype in consciousness. And the variations in the experience are mostly due to how much ego you have. Um, and that is the hardest one. You know, if you need to be humbled a lot, then the Phoenix process is going to be rough on you. Um, how much trauma you have. You know, a really well-balanced person with an open mind, but also with a healthy sense of skepticism that's already humble is not going to have much of a hard time with this process. But most of us, unfortunately, you know, we, you, you, uh, as Timothy Leary said, you have to go out of your head to find your mind. And um, a lot of this process does kind of resemble 
what we have been told in our culture is going insane. You know, this is seeing meaning and coincidences and having voices leading you, uh, predicting the future and all this sort of stuff, you know. When it, when it starts to happen, it's almost worse that you know it's real and it's not your imagination because you can't really get around it, you can't run away, you can't shut it down. Um, it's just something that you're forced to confront and uh, it can get very confusing and overwhelming. Okay, so the process. Usually it will start with synchronicities and the synchronicities will be uh, less spectacular and less frequent as it begins, but I think that as you have experiences that expand the parameters of what you think are possible, uh, the uh, intensity and the frequency and also the meaningfulness of these synchronicities accelerates and accelerates and accelerates. And this of, on its own can be an extremely difficult process because your belief system, your worldview, is uh, shaken up and kind of threatened by the surreal nature of the experiences that you're having. And um, you'll know that you're on the right track. One little bit of advice that I can offer is that these synchronicities will have conceptual continuity. They won't dead end. They will lead somewhere. If you guys have watched my Synchronicity 1111 video, um, you know the story about the ruler, you know, we're talking about the number 11 and there's two 11s on this ruler that my girlfriend is using. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, we're meeting with these Native Americans whose message is about 1111. And so every synchronicity led sort of conceptually, or, or, or I call it also the invisible thread that kind of weaves through these things. So, you know, it's teaching, it's revealing things to you. It's also sometimes warning. And this is, uh, this is one of the most difficult aspects is to know when to listen, know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And so as these synchronicities kind of increase and you learn to kind of interpret the signs, symbols, hints, and clues, um, and hopefully not misinterpret them because, you know, if you're following these things, you can really get yourself into some trouble if you sort of overcommit. The next thing that will happen is that you will notice that you have expanded capacities of mind, your uh, ability to predict and Probably the most difficult is that you will start to have voices in your head that will, things of significance that are gonna to happen to you in the near or remote future. You'll notice that it seems to be a lot more accurate than it was before. You'll experience telepathy with some regularity. Tell you things that you absolutely could not know that will turn out to be true. And the reason that this is so difficult for so many people is because, um, like Terrence McKenna said, hearing a voice in your head is no accomplishment, but figuring out if it's telling the truth or not is. And what happens is that as you develop the capacity or have the experience of making accurate predictions, of following synchronicities correctly, of having accurate intuition, um, as Aleister Crowley said, the most common mistake that a magician makes is to think that his magic can do more for him than it can. And you have to understand too, for those of you that aren't familiar, that when I say magician or Aleister Crowley says magician, what we mean is a person who has dedicated themselves to the expansion of consciousness and their role, their fundamental role, their, the point of their existence here in this incarnation and probably every incarnation uh, since the beginning of time is to pull the net of consciousness upwards. They're dragging humanity, the prima mobiles um, they've been called. So developing the discernment um, to tell actual intuitions from wish demons, which is when you really want to believe something is coming down the pipe from the universe, so you'll project the signs and symbols and hints and clues that are not actually there. And um, this is, it's, it's harder than you think because it, you know, after you've had these experiences that confirm that you're capable of it, it's very easy to start imagining it. Another experience that's very common uh, throughout the Phoenix process is that you will start remembering your incarnations. And it's an interesting thing because it's not so much, when I say remembering, um, part of this process is that your individual consciousness is sort of merging with the collective field of consciousness. So this remembering can have physical manifestations that are external to your internal world. In my case, I'll give an example. Uh, I had been entertaining the, the possibility that I was a certain person in a previous incarnation, and I wanted nothing to do with it. It's not like this was something that I you know, was really hoping or that I liked this person a lot and thought it would be cool. It, I was actually very much opposed to the idea that I had anything to do with this person. And I'm not gonna name that person right now. That'll be something that will come into the story later. Okay. So in my case, uh, you know, the universe was constantly bombarding me with these weird synchronicities regarding this person until I finally really started to look into it. It's like it demanded my attention and then sort of the coup d'etat 
of the uh, experience was that you know the art of gematria, the old mystical practice of adding letters together that also have numerical values, and then finding phrases that have the same numerical value. Uh, my name equaled the phrase "He whom is this person in question." And aside from these coincidences that seem to be insisting on this idea that I was the reincarnation of this person, um, I happened to acquire a book, uh, sort of at random, right around this time period. You know, these, like I said, conceptual continuity and the synchronicities. Um, I, I got this book, and in the book, the author describes some of this person's idiosyncrasies. And um, I had the same habits. And we're talking about, you know, like morning rituals. Like I would wear this really plush smoking jacket and make eggs and drink really black coffee that was mostly sugar. And, you know, I read that that was this person's morning ritual. And there were a lot of other things that I still did to this day, you know. So I found the evidence really compelling. What I'm getting at here is it's always important to consider other possibilities. Um, I am English. This person was English. And genetic memory has been proven. Um, there were a couple of cases of, of young kids that were able to indisputably remember things from their grandfather's lives, and uh, the other one was um, from a very small village. So this was taken as evidence of reincarnation, but in the one case, the kid was remembering his grandfather's memories. This is a direct ancestor. And the other kid was third generation from a very small town on an island. So the memories that he had that he remembered could easily have been from an ancestor. So we never really get like an absolute answer with any of this metaphysical stuff. And uh, part of the reason that I'm trying to convey this is because this just thinking in this way critically, a great exercise is balancing every thought or every idea with its opposite. This is a great way to come up with other possibilities to make sure that you're thinking holistically. And um, you know, the truth is often found in the middle. So this is a tremendously powerful exercise you can do. And this is something that can help keep you safe when you're experiencing all this weirdness during the Phoenix process is to remember that only the madman is absolutely sure. And there's a fine line between mystic genius and madman, you know. In almost every case, as I've said, the uh, mystic tends to go through a period that is nearly identical to madness. And so, you know, it, it, it'll find ways to sort of insist that you pay attention to certain things. Even when you get through this, your new reality has characteristics that we associate with things like schizophrenia. And so they can take some adjusting and remembering that there's always some multiple possibilities to explain any phenomenon is, you know, a good way from becoming dogmatic. So in summary of all this, basically, you know, and I'm going to make more videos that, that will go into more depth about, you know, techniques that you can use to sort of keep yourself stable. And I'll touch on some of that right now. Meditation is a huge thing. Uh, this process is often initiated by a psychedelic experience, but um, I would advise that once it really gets rolling, you probably don't need to take psychedelics for a while. I didn't throughout this entire process. I know that you hear these crazy stories on this channel and some of you might be thinking, well, this comes from a guy that drinks gallons of ayahuasca or whatever. That's not true to this day, but during this period in particular, I had totally stopped taking psychedelics, although the period was, I think, initiated by my first contact with uh, NN dimethyltryptamine, and I'll make a video about that because that got pretty weird. And then, you know, there are techniques for learning to develop your intuition so that you have more confidence when you're trying to figure out whether this is just a thought or whether this is an actual intuition. And uh, you'd be surprised how quickly these capacities can develop. And um, in a later video, I'll get into some exercises and techniques you can use for that as well. So. The gist of this thing is that you'll start to experience these synchronicities. You will make contact with what some people have called your holy guardian angel or um, the higher self. Uh, and it will prove its capacity for predator human knowledge to you in ways that cannot be denied. Um, and you will be tested. You'll probably go through a period, almost everyone does, that uh, some the mystics have called this the dark night of the soul. Uh, the crossing of the abyss is another phase of this journey that oftentimes results in uh, the, the magician losing all that he is and all that he was. Basically, the personality is completely reformatted. All of your material possessions you'll just walk away from at some point. I think this is uh, one of the reasons that people are afraid to embark on a spiritual journey because they know that very often people will do this, and I did it. And I think it's a necessary part of the process if you're committing this fully. 
and like I said before, the intensity of this experience, how dramatic it is, the impact on your life, all this depends on a number of factors that have a very wide range. Totally commit to this, you know, the path of the Magi, then, you know, it might not be so brutal. But for those of you that are really trying to take this as far as you can, um, you know, uh, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. You know, it's a difficult and intense process. And uh, the end goal, however, is full self-realization. Your humility is going to finally be where it needs to be if that was one of your issues. Your ability to manifest. I mean, my manifestation powers during this period were absurd. I mean, it, it was insane. I would like make lists of things like I was ordering them from the universe and then they would already be around me and I just didn't know it yet. I mean, and we'll, you know, I'll make some videos that kind of outline those experiences as well. Um, but your ability to manifest I think it's worthy of note that, you know, when I say powers of manifestation, it's important to consider that I don't necessarily 100% believe that that's what the explanation for that experience is. I think that there is at least circumstantial and anecdotal evidence in physics that supports uh, the idea that our consciousness has some influence on the behavior and, and arrangement of particles of energy, sort of drawn to you but I think it's also important to consider all the other possibilities and you know precognition um, and just sheer coincidence I mean if the materialist view of the universe is correct and we can't really assert that we're 100% sure that it's not the universe is already proof that highly improbable coincidences can congregate and create miracles so you know the consistency of this experience kind of does compel me to uh, believe that it is consciousness generating reality or our experience. And, you know, a couple of quick examples. Um, during this process, I started a band and I needed a very specific skill set from each of the different instruments. And I was in a relatively small town and the styles of music that I wanted to combine were pretty divergent and it was going to be difficult to find people that appreciated both. And, you know, as I started to kind of uh, really focus on my capacity to generate reality and experimenting with it, I said, okay, I need a band that consists of people with these capacities. And it turned out that the son of one of my business associates was a prodigy drummer that played jazz and heavy metal, which were the two styles that I needed. My coworker turned out to be an extraordinary singer. I had no idea. So all of the pieces, uh, turned out to be already it's like the universe had prearranged this stuff um, which also you know that that has happened with that characteristic of something higher so I think you know it's, it's worthy of consideration that consciousness is literally creating these things and it's kind of restrained by time and space so things still take time they need mechanisms to play out but your ideas can be formulated and then orchestrating stuff before I even realize what I'm asking for, it's already provided it. That's always sort of been evidence to me that there's some kind of higher intelligence at work in the universe. And so when I had the success with materializing this band, I thought, well, let's see what else I can do. And I was laying in my uh, cabin one night and I thought, well, if I could just marry a girl and I gave a very specific description, hair color, age, everything, and you know, from a very wealthy family and then her family is willing to throw money at the band because you know, like any business, you need some capital in order to take off. And almost immediately, I was engaged to this girl, and ultimately her family did offer to throw money at the music. So what I'm getting at with this, and I mean, I could go on and on, and I will in other videos talk some more about um, some of the experiences I've had. But even recently, the other day, I pulled a book off the shelf and opened it at random, and, and it was talking about how the wizard is somebody that can inject their intentions into the universe in such a way that they come back um, with, you know, greater consistency than, a, than like a regular person is capable of. And I thought about this snake that I had seen um, once a year ago here on the property. And I thought, well, I want to see that snake today then. And I walked out the door and it was sitting on the steps. I, I think this also kind of coincides with thinking a lot and getting my head back in this space that, you know, over the last couple of weeks since I've started trying to make this video, these experiences that I'm relating in the video have started to happen and I think that was part of my hesitation even because I felt like I was kind of opening a door that I had kind of closed. And 
you know, I, I think I mentioned in another video that somebody that was present throughout the entire Phoenix process, as I hadn't spoken to since that time period, which was 10 years ago. As soon as I committed to making the video, this person just randomly contacted me for the first time. So knowing your true will and developing the capacity to commit to it and to manifest exactly the life that you're intended to live here and also to benefit the rest of humanity to the greatest extent that you have the capacity to. So like, share, subscribe, watch out for more Phoenix Process videos. The next one I'm going to do is going to be the story of the skeleton man. So thanks a lot for watching.